Brother Popejoy. I want you to understand, I don't know if it'll pick up, but I'm going to do it anyway. I want you to understand what I've been dealing with for the past several years. Now here's an example of what this man has done to me, only an example of what this man has done to me. We have uh, Beyond Biden rebuilding the America we love, Newt Gingrich, history, short history of Russia, The Naked Communist, I would advise that book. It's very good. We have the authoritarian movement, Shapiro, Blackout, Candace Owens, United States of Socialism, Dinesh D'Souza, Dark Agenda, The War on America, God and Cancel Culture. Thank you, Rick. Give Me Liberty, Not Marxism, Karl Marx, his complete works, if you will, including the Communist Manifesto. Who was Karl Marx? That's a really good one. The Devil and Karl Marx, Mark Levin, American Marxism. We have Lenin, One Vote Away, Ted Cruz. I give up. I give up. <laughs> And yet all the answers are in this book, the Bible. That's some good material. And we need to study. Someone says, what does this matter? Why are we studying these things? Have you ever read 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32? And of the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times, to know what Israel, my Bible says the church is New Testament Israel, ought to do. The heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. Men who understood the times. If you go back in our brotherhood's work into the 1960s primarily, you'll see that communism was preached on in the church quite a bit. I was born in 1974. That was before my time. But these things matter. And so today we ask the question, does history matter? Yes, history matters. In the small town I was born in, a love lady all the way to Jerusalem, I've been there, to the hills of Kentucky, all exploring the restoration movement this week. I certainly enjoyed some of that study. You know, history does matter. As the famous statement goes, those who do not remember history, of course, are going to repeat it, and we want to know and study. We need to study about all false doctrines, Romans chapter 16, verse number 17, so we can mark and avoid those who teach things contrary to that which we've learned. They're to be avoided, the Bible says. We know in 2 John verse 9 that whosoever goes onward and abides not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. It's imperative that we know what the Scriptures teach about all things. Who was Karl Marx? It was January 2021 and I was in Miami, Florida, worshiping the God of heaven. And in front of me was a gentleman and he had a mask on. That's his privilege to do that. And he had on that mask BLM. Who was Karl Marx? In 2020 in Portland, Oregon, I'm sure you remember, cities were burning. Literally miles of buildings had been destroyed. Antifa, BLM, the George Floyd riots. Some 270,000 people have crossed our border illegally in November of 2021 alone. The estimate now is 5 million people. In essence, Houston, one of the largest cities in America, has come across the border in the last few years illegally. Who was Karl Marx? We've heard about critical race theory, critical gender theory, things of this nature. And I ask again, who was Karl Marx? One statistic says that in 1942, 25% of Americans considered socialism a good thing. In 2019, that number, according to this poll, had risen to 43%. When you began to study into the Gen Z in this type of situation, you find that 30% of Gen Z have a favorable view of Marxism, up 6% from 2019. Over one-third of Americans, some 39%, are likely to support a member of the Democratic Socialist Party. And when you get to Gen Z, some statistics show that over 51% are favorable to this idea of socialism or communism. If you don't think we've had a problem with this in the last few years, I'm, I'm supposing you've been asleep for a couple of years. Who was Karl Marx? Well, first of all, we need to talk about the man. 
we have time, we're going to look at his philosophy, interrelated concepts, look at things as seen today, and then do biblical refutation. Translation, I'll have my introduction, I'll skip to the end <laughs> for lack of time. Karl Marx was born in Germany in 1818. Get your minds around the date and the time, 1818. Think of the War of 1812. Think of 1818. He was, he was a born. His father was from a long line of distinguished rabbis. He later would reject that and become a Protestant, although it seems he did it for political purposes, uh, primarily being forced kind of to do that for his money. And, and he was pretty well off, pretty successful guy. But Marx's father began to introduce him, even as a young boy, Carl, that is, introduced Carl to Voltaire, Rousseau. In fact, uh, Marx had a Kantian headmaster. He said, well, who are all these people? Rousseau and Voltaire and uh, Emmanuel or Emmanuel Kant. Well, think of the idea of, of Kant or Kant, however you would say it, the idea of reason alone. Brother um, Moser last night dealt with um, some of these things. We're going to have to talk about some of this. He went to the University of Bonn in 1835 after getting out of high school with high marks and then later transferred to the University of Berlin after he got in trouble for drinking and some other things. The young man, I'm talking about Carl now. And if, he then began to focus not on law but on philosophy. And, of course, this would get into his study. He was in a group called the Young Hegelians. And you think, well, well, who is that? Who is Hegel? What is all this about? Well, these things will come into play more and more as we keep going through this lesson. He would then go on and get his doctoral thesis. Um, and, of course, who was the one that encouraged him to get that particular doctorate? That would be Bruno Barr. Someone says, I don't know who he is either. Well, we'll get there. These people began to infiltrate his mind. He would study these German rationalists, if you will. He would study the uh, French Revolution. And there's a big difference in the French Revolution and the American Revolution. Let me just say it this way. French Revolution, the idea of anarchy and collective, collectivism as opposed to the freedoms and the concept of individual liberty found within the American uh, situation. People try to say they're the same. They're not even close to the same. He, of course, married a Jenny. And uh, she was uh, uh, quite interesting. Uh, sacrifice. She came from money. And yet she spent a miserable life with him. They were broke all the time, mainly because he was a bum and wouldn't work, if you want uh, just the long and short of it. But we study all these things. In fact, I want you to picture this man. I may bring this up if I have time, but at his funeral, only seven, one verse says 11, some say seven people at his funeral. Him and old Ingalls, you know, Ingalls and Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto together. I have a copy down there. I'll refer to that shortly. We could go on and on about Marx the man, but I want to look at his philosophy. What is classical Marxism? And what we're seeing now in America is cultural Marxism. But what is this idea of Marxism coming from Karl Marx, who had studied all of these people early on in his life, these German rationalists, if you will? Well, it's the idea of um, class struggle. You know, um, one of my girls asked me after studying all these books, and I didn't you know, read every piece of these, but I read a lot of them and parts of a lot of them, just thousands of pages, however many, over the last few years. And one of the girls walks in one day, and I'm doing what I always do, studying about communism, <laughs> and um, said, well, Dad, what, what, is, what is all this about, Karl Marx or Lenin or whoever you're studying? What's it all about? I'm thinking, how am I going to tell in a, in a very short phrase you know, to maybe it's Julia and she's 12 or Jenna, she's 15. And I thought, I mean, honestly, it's all about stealing and killing. And I thought, thanks a lot, Pope Joy. I've studied all this stuff and I just summarized it in one sentence. <laughs> what is classical Marxism? What is um, dialectical materialism? What is economic determinism? You have to study all these things, but I want to break it down. In essence, classic Marxism, or the idea when you get into dialectical materialism, is simply this idea of conflict or struggle. He would then apply it economically to classes. And so you have the proletariat, you have the bourgeoisie, or however you would say that. And so this is the idea of those who are the workers, and then those who are the owners, 
And so there's always this class struggle. So he would take these struggles, Hegel and others who would see that that things were being shaped through this world spirit, if you will. And he says, well, I I don't believe that. And I'm going to apply it materially. And so there's always this struggle. And so people are always going to do whatever they have to do to get ahead and make money and take care of themselves. And it's going to create this great conflict that eventually will erupt in socialism and the workers are going to rise up they're going to overthrow capitalistic systems and then you're going to have communism that emerges from socialism and eventually you have this utopia where you don't even need a government because after all everybody's just going to do things in a very selfless way we'll get to vladimir lenin in a couple of hours but uh, this is really this idea of classic marxism now what's interesting i've already learned some lessons already. Number one, I see when I think about Marx, the idea of the influence of a father on a son. His father instilled him with this stuff even as a young boy. Let me tell you something. The Bible teaches that fathers are to raise their children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're to teach them in the way. We're to teach them when they're resting, when they're rising up, the Bible would go on to say. And so we need to understand the influence of a father on a son, both for good or for evil. I I learned that lesson. Number two, I see who you marry. He married a woman who supported him in all of the things that he needed to be supported in to propagate his error. I married a woman who will tell me what I need to hear even when I don't want to hear it. But he married this poor lady who just supported him and lived in misery as he would go off to the library, study all day long, every day, year after year after year at the British Museum as she and the kids were basically starving to death. So I see lessons on who you marry, lessons on how you raise your children already. Well, if you go on and you study some more of this philosophy, he then combines all these things again, showing this um, great conflict between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. You know, he would say this. He said, the working men have no country. That's one of his famous quotes. And so it's the idea they're going to rise up. Let me make it, in, let, can I make it modern for you. In other words, they don't have anything, even though all belong to them, the workers, they're actually doing everything. Let me just put it in modern terms. Our president in the past, Obama, you know what he said? He said, you didn't build that. You didn't build that. That's Marxism. Now, understand, anybody who builds something understands there are other people involved. We understand that. But when people make statements like that to those who've built a business, what they're in essence saying is, you didn't take any risks. You didn't go out and raise money. You didn't have blood, sweat, and tears to do these things. After all, you didn't build that because it's all a collective. That's a Marxist statement, my friends. I think we we have people today, they don't even realize sometimes they make Marxist statements or humanistic statements. I guess I left it in the car, but I have a little book called The Humanist Manifesto, number one and number two. Let me tell you, The Humanist Manifesto, they set this stuff out over 100 years ago, almost 100 years ago, and they began to have this long march through history. And so they have these, these, these uh, pop dreams, if you will. You know, I say this as a, as a young man who was raised in a good family. By the way, isn't that what God wants you to be raised in, is a good family? A father who loved his mother and, and, and the mom who loved the dad. And they raised the children right and uh, weren't perfect, but raised me according to the precepts of the Scripture. I know when we were first married, we were broke. I mean broke. I can remember BJ telling me just recently about when we were in preaching school. She said, yeah, I remember I ironed those four shirts you had all the time over and over and over because you didn't even have any more shirts. We couldn't even afford to get any kind of cable TV. By the way, that's a first world problem, isn't it? I know what it's like to eat Captain Vitamin. And let me tell you something, that's not Captain Crunch. I also know the Lord has blessed me through an economy to work hard and be able to make money and and be blessed in those ways too. So I speak from both ends of the spectrum, the young Jason and the old Jason. But I understand when I begin to study these things and see what's going on within Marxism, I understand that it's, that it's, it's wrong from its very philosophy. It teaches the concept of greed and theft as they oppose greed. They'll say, well... The bourgeoisie, they're greedy. All they do is take the profit and the money. And so, therefore, it's okay later to have violence, to even take it from them, to redistribute it. And yet, that's theft. Now, the Bible condemns these things. Theft and stealing is wrong. So, it says, Jason, prove to me from the Bible this idea of communism that it's not not okay. 
Because after all, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, they shared all things in common. Uh, several times it says this in the book of Acts. So is it that communism? No, it's not. That's called charity. That's called giving. That's called giving out of one's, watch this, free will voluntarily. Not forced giving. There's a big difference there. Now, you can just go to the Old Testament in your mind. What does God say in the Old Testament? Thou shalt not steal, which implies that it doesn't belong to you. Also, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house and wife and so forth. That means that house doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. There's ownership there. You go over to the Acts, Acts uh, chapter 4 and chapter 5, and Barnabas took land and sold it and gave, again, individual free will charity. Acts chapter 5, remember Ananias and Sapphira? And even Peter says to them on, uh, on that occasion there, he says, when you had, they lied about how much they gave. And then he said, when you had it, was it not in your own power? Now that's individual ownership of private property, which is one of the things he attacks in the Communist Manifesto, the idea of private property. But let me tell you how they distort things. Here's what they do. They would come and they'd say, well, you just use religion. By the way, they think religion is an invention of man in order to salve the conscience. And so they would say, well, you teach through religion. The Bible teaches things such as humility and, and the idea of, well, this world is not our home. They do all that to salve the woes of the proletariat. That's what they're really doing well the problem is that's what the Lord taught he taught a better way of living which is thinking of other people instead of actually being selfish they teach the reverse of this or they'll take they'll take statements again um, you know like a, a to take a wife and a husband they'll say well if if the reason the reason the wife needs to be liberated is because she's obedient to her husband because really she's his watch this private property they teach things like that now, if by private property you mean she belongs to me and not you, then yes, sir, I guess I agree with that. Because the Bible says a man should have his own wife, watch this, but a wife should also have her own husband. So it's, it's mutual private property. That's not the way they mean it, though. They would then say she needs to be liberated so that one day she could be a woman that does not even have a husband or a man that has a wife because really they don't believe in any kind of restraint. They are even against the family. Hence, if you went to the original BLM website, it said we are a Marxist organization and we are against the nuclear family. There's a reason for that. Karl Marx, Frederick Engel, they knew exactly what they were doing when they began to take these German philosophies and apply them to economics. And they said, look, the home only exists to support rules and structure. By the way, the government, can I just pre forget the notes? Can, can, can the, the government only exists to, to support the structure of those in charge, again, bourgeoisie, because eventually if you got rid of all that, you wouldn't even have a structure at all. That is absolutely ridiculous. So many statements in the Bible that contradict Jesus said, the poor you always have with you. Government was designed by God in order to have a civil society. Romans 13, 1 and following. So many other things we could go into. And you think about the abolition of the family. No wonder then, when you study both Marx and, and uh, Vladimir Lenin later on, both of them were adulterers. They both were neglectful to their families in so many ways. Now, you compare all of that type of thing. Taking someone's private property. Uh, one of my favorite illustrations, one of the books I read, is it has an example of a person with a jacket on. And all, the next scene is the jacket is ripped off of his back. <clears throat> And the basically, we would call the thief, has the jacket on. And he says, you don't deserve that jacket. The, the, I'm taking it from you. Um, you know, basically, you don't deserve it at all. And it's showing a socialistic concept, a communistic concept of theft. And the, the little guy who's now freezing to death without the jacket, he says, but, but I worked and saved and scrimped to, to buy that jacket. And now you're taking this from me. That's what communism in essence tries to do is it doesn't believe in work ethic. My Bible teaches work ethic. Whatever a man uh, puts his hand or mind to, he should do it with all of his might, right? The Bible says whatever your hand finds to do, do with all of your might. Hardly, another scripture says, as unto the Lord. And so we now live in America, and I'm very thankful to live in America. I really am. I'm, I'm, I'm so thankful for that compared to the stuff I've been studying. By the way, how many people have died according to what communism has put in place? Some estimates over 100 million. Over 100 million people have died because of the e evils of communism. 
But I think about that and I think about work ethic. If a man won't work, neither should he eat. Boy, that should have applied to Karl Marx. That man wouldn't work. How was he supported? The co-writer of the manifesto, Ingalls. Well, where did Ingalls get all the money? From his daddy who owned a business? So his daddy who owned a business gave the money to him who he gave it to Karl Bum Marx so he then could be a bum and not take care of his own family and they're starving to death all the time. People would write and get more money. Finally, Ingalls give him more money. It's unbelievable. But the Bible says if a man won't work, neither shall he eat. It teaches work ethic. It teaches loving your family, caring for your family, taking care of your family. All these scriptures come to mind. Think about laziness in the Bible. Matthew 25, 46. Have you ever noticed there in Matthew 25, 46 in that judgment scene, there's the ones that are condemned there, the person condemned there, it says, he says, you, you uh, slothful and wicked servant. It puts laziness right there with wickedness. According to Matthew 25 and verse number 46. Proverbs 13, 4. The soul of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing. Unless he has Ingalls to fund him, I guess. Based on a business concept is where he got the money anyway. But the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. My Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 that a man ought to labor with his hands working in that thing. Here's important. That which is good. Why? That he may have to give. Charity. Individual choice. To him that has need. They, taste, they say, take it, steal it, do what you want to with it out of a selfish motive as opposed to Christianity, which teaches hard work, diligence, sacrifice, true love, kindness, charity. I think about our Lord, Acts 10, verse 38. He went about doing good. Galatians 6, 10. Do good unto all men, especially unto those that are of the household of faith. But when you get in and break down their manifesto, this is from the Humanist Manifesto. Here's some of their uh, statements in the book. Abolition of property. A heavy income tax. Why? Well, because you don't deserve it, but they, that's, that, that's theft. Oh, it's redistribution of wealth. Why? Based on what? Based on the fact that someone worked harder. We'll get to some of these critical theories in a minute. Maybe in the second lesson. Abolition of all right of inheritance. Think about that. They said a person shouldn't have an inheritance. The Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children. They never read Proverbs. Centralization of credit in the hands of the state. Exclusive monopoly. Transport in the hands of the state. Factories owned by the state. This is all from the Humanist Manifesto. Equal, I know this is almost laughable. Equal obligation to work. Equal obligation to work. So you've taken away my motivation. You work as hard as you can. You do whatever you're going to do, and you'll get the same amount of money. It's kind of like one time I was at a place and asked two young ladies in college who they were voting for. One was voting for the conservative person, one for the liberal person. One that was more freedom concept, one was more Marxist concept. And I said, let me ask you a question. Who y'all vote for? And they each said the opposite person. So I said, let me ask y'all a question. I said, if, if um, y'all were in my class and I was teaching school and you worked really hard, I mean all the time, studying, effort, diligence, and you were making an A. You know, Rick over here, he's, uh, you know, he shows up about every third day, he does okay, kind of works, kind of doesn't work, and he's making a, an F. What would you think if I were to say, you know what, I'm just going to average all that and I'm going to give both of you a C. Not one, but two of the young ladies instantly said, that's not fair. I said, welcome to the Republican Party. <laughs> but the point is, it's not about Democrats or Republicans. It's about conservatives and what the Scripture teaches. But I can tell you this much. I'm not telling people how to vote, but you better vote like the Bible teaches. If you've got people who are saying you can murder babies, by the way, communists believe in murder. If you have people who believe you can steal things, communists believe in stealing, then you've got a problem. You need to think about how you vote, but that'll be up to you. I don't go in the voting booth with you, but I'm going to vote with my values. I know that. Can I just say this much, too? When you get into some of the practical situations that we're dealing with here, you're, you're, you're dealing with people who don't believe. Here's the, here's the long and short of it. You talk about Karl Marx and communism, socialism. And there's, I know there's a spectrum. There's, oh, we believe in you know, the, the, the socialist approach, not the communist approach. It's six of one, half a dozen of the other. It leaves the same thing eventually. Some believe in violence. Some don't believe in violence. The same mindset. But here's the key. They don't believe in individual responsibility. 
They don't believe in individual accountability. It's all collective. It's, that's why they classify people. Oh, I'm trying to get in critical theory to my third lesson, but I might have to do it. But they don't believe in individual. They believe in collective. Because guess what? If we can make people collective, then we do away with individuals' decisions and choices. But yet the Bible teaches, John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, the hour is coming, and when all that are in the grave shall come forth. He that hath done, he that hath done good to the resurrection of life. And he that hath done evil to the resurrection of damnation. 2 Corinthians 5.10 We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Not as a group. Not collectively, but individually. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive for the things done in his body. Whether it be good or whether it be bad. That is not what communism teaches. That is not what Karl Marx theories that was predicated and based on German rationalism. They didn't, they didn't teach that. They didn't believe that. And so as a result, you have all these things that come into play. Social movement theory. And the idea of um, uh, critical theory and so forth and so on. I'll talk about that in our second lesson at 3 o'clock. Can I just say what's behind a lot of this that led Carl to do what he did? I want you to understand modernism, postmodernism, and deconstructionism. I, this, I need to get this in here as a good time as any. What do you mean, Jason? Modernism, postmodernism, deconstructionism. Now, I can get through all the fancy definitions, but I want to try to make it plain. Here's modernism. This is kind of steeped in all that German, German rationalist thought. And you go back into the 17 and 1800s, and they began to uh, uh, dissect the scriptures and fight the scriptures. And so as a result, they said, well, there's truth, maybe, but it's not in the Bible. Certainly not in the Bible. That's, mo that's modernism. Postmodernism comes along, and some of this is in your notes. Postmodernism comes along and says, no, 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 no. It's not that there's just not truth in the Bible. There's no truth at all. And then the deconstruction, deconstructionist people, what they say is, well, language is basically, it's based on culture. You ever heard of systemic racism and critical theory and critical gender theory. It's, it's based on who you are, but based on who you are is based on an environment, and so it, therefore it's, it's systemic, and so language is, is created. That's what they're teaching. You ever, you ever confronted a deconstructionist? I remember even back in college confronting a deconstructionist. He, we read a book. We were supposed to read a book. We read the book. He comes back. He then takes the book and he begins to explain to the book, explain what the book meant, but that ain't what I read in a book. He said, I know this is what the author said, but let me tell you what he meant. So he takes this situation where somebody's in a train and somebody gets shot and then, the, the, and then he begins to break it down and the gun represents, you know, sexual things. And I'm thinking, what book are you reading? That's not what I read in that book. Oh, no, 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 but you can't understand. See, the language has to be deconstructed because he had a, social, a, a certain cultural bias, and therefore I have to deconstruct the language in order to reconstruct the language so that I can make sense of it, and that's why I'm telling you this is what it means. Now, I'm from a town of 600 people, and in our town, the buses have a beeper. You go, beep, 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 you back it up. So I'm thinking, wait a minute, you got to back this bus up a minute. Hold on a minute. So let me get this right in my, my country boy kind of thinking. So you're telling me that language, all of it, is based on culture, that this person always has to write or speak out of a bias. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Huh. Does that include you? Yeah, it does include you. Oh, you mean you got a bias too then? So then how, Hoss, are you going to deconstruct it when you need deconstructing yourself? See, it is hypocritical, ridiculous, and stupid. It's the same thing when a person says, don't you judge me as they judge. Friends, welcome to the world of critical theory. How many people do you think have studied and realized that this stuff was brought to Columbia University by, by, in, in the Frankfurt School many years ago? Herbert Marcuse and the idea of the Frankfurt School introducing critical theory. And you get in day and you study Abraham X. Kennedy and all these people and white fragility and all this kind of stuff. And what they'll say is, Rick, you know what? You're, you're racist because your white is systemic. 
No, sir, my Bible says individual decision. If every person in this room who was white was racist or every person who was black was racist, guess what? That doesn't mean the next person that walks to that door has to be racist. It's individual choice. James chapter 2 says all racism is a sin, beginning of verse number 1. But when you begin to group and categorize people that way, you are teaching what the scriptures do not teach. And this is all what they were doing in an economic way, classical Marxism. And now it's been, it's put, been put into our society in, through cultural Marxism. And do you know where this stuff is being taught over and over and over? Universities. Now it's in high schools. And it's in elementary schools. And it's in junior highs. All the way up. It's been in the universities for a long time. Oh, Jason, it's not a new... Hey, I know what I'm talking about. Ask my boy Josiah. He's here. He went to Texas A&M University, graduated from there. He came home one day. He said, Dad, you ain't going to believe this. I said, what? He said, I'm in one of my classes today, and the professor gets up and says, I just want you guys to know I am a Marxist. And I will be teaching Marxist philosophy in this class. It's happening all over the place. Been happening for a long time. Remember the Humanist Manifesto 1, the Humanist Manifesto 2? I'm telling you, when you begin to study this stuff, you understand this is not accidental. It's not accidental when you have a person uh, like the current vice president who was, who was the attorney general in the state of California, and when she was the attorney general of the state of California, she prosecuted a, a reporter who discovered that Planned Parenthood was selling baby body parts. Now, don't misunderstand what I said. She didn't prosecute Planned Parenthood for selling baby body parts. She prosecuted the people who reported they were selling baby body parts. President, uh, Vice President of the United States. The President of the United States, he made this comment before he was President. He said, he said, transgenderism, remember critical theory, critical race theory, critical gender theory. He said, transgenderism is the civil rights issue of our day. I don't agree religiously with Martin Luther King Jr., but I like the statement he made that, that it's based on the character of a man and not, and not the uh, uh, color or culture, but it's based on his character the way things would be. That was a good statement. That's not happening with all these people. We're not talking about the civil rights issue in the 60s. We're talking a whole different mindset, and it's all based on cultural Marxism, which is based on classical Marxism, which goes back, again, to lack of individual choice. You know, I don't want you to get mad at me, but if you do, that's okay. I want you to understand the scriptures teach us that we can know truth and follow truth. Let me just say this about critical race theory, page 130 on your notes. CRT goes beyond arguing that the different cultures are equally valid. It declares that society is a systemically racist, white dominant culture and enlists those who are disaffected. Can I just say this as I keep going? The KKK is a wicked, evil organization, and BLM Inc. is too. Antifa, all of them. They're all racist and problematic and Marxist. Some of them Marxist, some of them just racist, but they're evil. He, he, this person goes on and says, those who are di um, disaffected, dissatisfied, and malcontented into a growing legion of anti-American revolutionaries. Like Marx, the CRT proponents deal in group stereotypes and prejudices. Assumptions are made, that's the problem, about individuals grounded on their physical, religious, ancestral, and other characteristics. CRT is pseudo-scholarship based on victimization. That's a big deal. Emotional appeals, balkanization, and separatism. Oh, Jason, you don't understand. You don't understand. The police inherently, they need to be defunded because they are racist. Go do the statistics. If you are in a place, I don't care what color person is, and 90% of the people are that are committing crimes or being, the ones being arrested, maybe it's because they're the people committing the crimes. That could be the case. And yet they, they reject the, 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 the information and the, 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 the data that's given. And what if a person, what if that particular policeman was racist? That's a sin. Just like murder's a sin and theft's a sin and all these things are sin. And it makes me so, ha and, uh, it makes me so sad the way that they, they twist these things around. Oh, Jason, that's the way people in the church don't believe this kind of stuff. You think not? We got people sometimes in the church 
I've been preaching before, had people walk out of my out of my sermon before because I made comments about particular people, not based on what color they are, but based on their politics, which was tied not to their politics, but to their moral beliefs. How dare you say that? It doesn't matter what color what color a person is. We're not, can I just say it this way? We're not talking about color. We're talking about culture. And we're talking about culture based on if people follow the Bible or not. There are a lot of problems in the white community, black community, Hispanic community, Indian community. You know why? You know why the Indians are having so many problems? Can I just say it? I'll tell you why. Because they got all the casinos and the gambling and the drinking. You know why you're having so many problems in a lot of the black communities? Because they hadn't had a mama and a daddy cycle after cycle after cycle after cycle. It's not systemic. Oh, yes, it is, but it's a different kind of systemic. It's systemically not following the Word of God. That's the problem. They're not following what the Bible teaches about a daddy and a mama and children. Don't tell me it's about racism. It's not about racism. It's about rejection of Genesis chapter 3, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3. We have it in the church. You got people today, their wife, their wife doesn't take care of things at the home. They're not going to take care of the children. You got men acting like women and women acting like men. No wonder then that women think they're men and men think they're women. We had not been teaching the truth in the country and some's in the church on marriage, divorce, and remarriage for 75 years. And then we wonder why a man can marry a man. We weren't teaching the truth when a man was marrying the wrong woman. All I'm trying to say is this. We've got to preach the word of God and love the souls of men. All men. All women. You know why? Because men like Karl Marx... They don't love the truth. Who was Karl Marx? He was a man who took the teachings of German rationalist thought, applied them to economics, and laid the groundwork for a great monster named Vladimir Lenin, which we'll study about, Lord willing, in about an hour. Thank you for your time. What Jason actually meant was that